All right. Great, great. It's time for Spirit in Mind. It will be in a few moments. Let some people know we're on. We're grateful to have you joining us. We have, we're going to continue from last week. We had a powerful discussion uh, on um, critical decisions. We had so much uh, response and feedback. We're going to continue with that. How's your week been, Dr. Shepard? Yes, sir. Good morning slash afternoon, Bishop. Uh, the week has been a, um, uh, I won't say a troubling week, but it has definitely been an exhausting week. Uh, it has just been so much that has been going on um, within uh, the professional realm. Um, I will say this, uh, and I don't say this lightly. Uh, I thank God for uh, I thank God for you. I thank God for this platform. I thank God for the ability to come out to uh, be able to help people on a weekly basis. Um, you know, that's what makes it all worthwhile. Uh, last week we did get get some uh, very good comments, and I was able to able to even follow up with a few people uh, who I have not heard from uh, in a while. And um, the show was really helpful for them. And I'm looking forward for them to joining us again uh, today. Uh, and so I want people to know before I turn it back over to you that we take uh, pride in uh, making sure that uh, our information uh, is as accurate as possible and uh, is not haphazard. Um, not talking about anybody, but I know some folks are just doing some haphazard stuff on social media. Uh, this is not haphazard. Uh, we do make outlines and we study and we converse uh, prior to. So uh, I hope that uh, that that uh, that this time is well spent today. So just need to say that today. Absolutely. And I concur 100 percent. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, Angela Pinkney and uh, uh, Minister Audrey Hill and uh, Sister Michelle Dixon. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, uh, let somebody know those others who are watching. We're grateful for you. Again, we uh, we we do uh, study to show ourselves approved. This is our prayer uh, for this time of sharing. Dr. Shepard is a scientist and and a committed uh, uh, minister of the gospel, and uh, um, we try to come uh, correct with our academic research and preparation as well as uh, being prayerful. And so, with all of that said, um, it's time for spirit in mind, and we. Uh, we'll be getting going. Then look, we got a theme song that we like to share. Again, we welcome you to the Spirit and Mind uh, broadcast where we are committed uh, and all about the critical collaboration of ministry and mental health uh, or the ministry of mental health. This is Bishop Guy Robinson with my ministerial colleague and psychiatrist, Dr. Jonathan Shepard, uh, bringing you greetings and uh, how particularly poignant it is that we get to share with you today. We're blessed. Uh, this is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month still, and uh, we uh, are blessed to have this opportunity to continue to raise awareness uh, about the uh, mental health uh, 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 concerns and, and wellness uh, um, that um, are, are so important, I believe, particularly in these times. Um, amen. Last week, we began the discussion about making decisions in turbulent times. Uh, and uh, so I started uh, um, in my uh, time of reflection, Dr. Shepard, I started thinking about some definitions. Turbulence is unsteady or violent movement uh, as suggested in that definition, unsteady or violent movement, um, meaning that it's on a continuum. Uh, if you've ever taken a flight, mm -hmm. you know that sometimes they talk about mild turbulence and severe turbulence uh, because it is on mm -hmm. a continuum from unsteady mildly to violently. And uh, 
I want to submit to us as we launch off the greater the turbulence, the more critical the decisions are that we need to make. Um, and uh, absolutely, amen. So that was my thought, Dr. Shepherd. Uh, that if we are in turbulent times, um, how turbulent are they, and um, how critical are our decisions? And uh, I put these out rhetorically, you know, reflectively. Um, and I started thinking from there. Um, and then I'd love to, um, I'd love for you to jump in on this, Dr. Shepard. We need your wisdom. I started thinking that crisis, uh, 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 so it, uh, it's, it is an interesting word. Um, in the Chinese, the symbols crises are two symbols, one of danger and one of opportunity. And so it's both a dangerous time and a time for great opportunity, depending on the decisions. In the Greek, the word crisis, crisis means to be at a decision point. Uh, it kind of gives this idea of being at a fork in the road. Of course, at a fork in the road, you can go left, you can go right, but you can't go the way you've been going. And um, that's the idea behind the crisis. And so certainly, um, Dr. Shepard, that they were just my questions, and I don't know uh, what, what your feedback might be, but uh, how severe is the turbulence in these times, and how critical is it that we make healthy, opportunistic decisions? Absolutely. Um, and uh, thank you, Bishop, for that lead-in. Uh, excellent uh, way for me to just expound upon this critical topic. Um, so when you talk about turbulence, you know, you explain so well about how when we're flying on a plane, you could experience mild, medium, severe turbulence. But when you think about your own lives, uh, we go through turbulent times. Uh, the scripture tells us that if you're born of a woman, uh, your days will be few and full of trouble, which just means turbulence. Uh, so we're destined to have turbulent, uh, turbulence in our lives. This year, 2020, has probably been one of the most turbulent times for all of us uh, because it has disrupted our very way of living. And I would say, my opinion, that this is, for some people, the most turbulent that times that they've ever lived through uh, and may ever live through, truthfully. Um, so the, the decisions that we're making right now are critical. Uh, do we go back? And we dealt a little bit with this um, uh, last week. Do we go back to the way in which we were living? Do we go back to doing some of the things that we used to be doing? So you look at the different uh, uh, avenues or, or ways in which we live. You start with your job. Do you go back to your job? If you go back to your job, do you go back to the way in which you worked? Uh, if you were in a cubicle setting, do you now have to work from home because the space is not adequate enough for physical distancing? Uh, in my practice, do I go back to just doing all telehealth sessions or do I do face-to-face -face encounters? And let me tell you, uh, there are doctors who are afraid to go back to seeing people face-to-face uh, -face. and I get it. I can't fault them because you don't know what people may be caring or what uh, uh, infectious disease or, or or illness that they may have. So uh, yes, even those who have been trained to handle illness, there is even fear amongst that population. You need to know that. Um, there's nothing wrong with going through turbulent times. There's nothing wrong with experiencing the emotions that you experience during turbulent times. The thing is, what are you going to decide or what decision are you going to make on how to move forward in these turbulent times? And that's what we're really stressing right now. Um, governmental officials, and then I'll leave it alone, governmental officials are, are, are struggling. We're here in the state of Maryland. And so the governor came out on Wednesday lifting uh, the stay at home order, and allowing us to go into phase one as a state. But then the local governments, the city and the county officials, uh, they had to make their own decision whether or not they're going to listen to the governor, depending on what is occurring 
within their own personal space. Yeah. And so you, as you're listening to us, you have to be able to make that personal decision as to what you're going to do. And so hopefully what we talk about today will help you to make that decision. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and just by way of recap, we talked about some of those kinds and many patterns for decision making uh, in psychology. There's uh, what is sometimes called uh, impulsive decisions. And then there are rational decisions. Uh, so there's two categories. So that's a good question we can ask ourselves. Is this an impulsive decision or is this a rational decision? We talked about the theological paradigm that I personally uh, 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 present, and uh, um, the Lord gave to me uh, in First Thessalonians five twenty three of uh, spiritual decisions, um, soulful decisions, meaning mind, will, and emotions, or rational, and then bodily decisions because sometimes our bodies talk to us, especially uh, uh, anyone who comes from. Uh, history of knowing, uh, familiar with patterns of addiction and those kinds of things, you know that there can be somatic conversation going on. Uh, um, and so uh, just want to be mindful to give us a pattern. And then we talked about uh, 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 sort of the pattern for decision making uh, that we proposed last week of catharsis or cleaning it out, get it out, get it out in a journal before you post it on social media and have to apologize for it and or defend yourself and or get anxious and or defensive about other people's responses uh, or texts online. So get it out, write it in a journal, take it to the Lord in prayer, but catharsis because you need to get it out because your body is telling you that. And if you're an extrovert, you got to get it out. And so we acknowledge that that's the cleansing. Then the consultation, talk to somebody, and then go back and check and see if that's still print worthy. Uh, and, then, um, and then consider the alternatives and then make a commitment to a decision so that you don't waver in indecision because even indecision, as we said last week, is a decision. Uh, you remember when the prophet uh, asked, how long will you halt between two opinions? How long are you gonna stay stuck in this place? the fear of making the decision. Choose this day whom you will serve. Look at the scriptures. I'd rather you were hot or cold, but I'd rather you not be. What is distasteful is if you stay in this place of indecision uh, as, a, as a mechanism for getting stuck. So uh, these several decisions were made this week. Uh, Dr. Shepard, you touched on the national decisions. Uh, of course, there's a, and on the national level, there's two, almost two categories to simplify them, if you will. Uh, there's the political uh, um, executive level of decision making. And then there's, uh, I kind of distinguish them from the medical because sometimes they are kind of at tension points. Um, <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> so would you talk about some of the decisions? Of course, you touched on uh, the decisions that um, the made on the government level, on the gubernatorial level, and then the mayoral level, and county executives even here in Maryland all have different um, um, kinds of responses or stages that they're in of this, uh, of this decision making process. Um, what are some of the decisions and perspectives of the men, uh, mental and or medical community? Absolutely. Uh, so let me just uh, comment. I, I don't want to let this comment go. Uh, we, uh, we are seeing the medical community be in conflict with the government, if I just use that word, the government community, uh, play out before us. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci versus President Donald Trump. Uh, we're seeing this play out uh, as we continue to see uh, reports from the White House stating that we would have a vaccine before the end of 2020. There is no guarantee that we will see a vaccine by the end of 2020. Uh, we really need to make, be careful on the information that goes out. And so that's why I really even take this particular type of time that we spend today in providing accurate, uh, insightful information because there's just so much just false news and just people are confused because 
there's not one voice right now. And so, um, you know, I just had to mention that because you're absolutely right. Medical advice will go against what the, what other people may be saying. Uh, even as I'm led, there's another point I want to make, but uh, I'm thinking even within the church world, um, you, sometimes there is a conflict of interest between what, what the preacher says, what the doctor told you versus what they're saying, what God told you. Um, and we can really stay there for a bit. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've heard plenty, plenty, plenty of messages say, uh, you know, well, God is the ultimate doctor and he is the ultimate doctor. I believe that he's the ultimate healer. Um, but I've heard where people have uh, almost defamed the practice of medicine in an effort to build up uh, a person's uh, inspiration. And I don't think that that's right. That, that's me speaking. Um, so that, that conflict, the medical community does get a black eye at times uh, from those in different religious circles or from even governmental circles because they don't like to hear what is being said. The thing that I like uh, is, which helps me to reconcile, which is why I don't get upset or frustrated uh, because I understand who has the final say. I understand who's in control. Um, and so many, uh, uh, many physicians are actually true believers because uh, they talk about that whole um, piece of uh, knowing that prayer works, uh, knowing that meditation, knowing that believing in their words, sometimes a higher power helps centers a person even and pro provides rapid healing. Uh, so uh, that whole struggle between the medical community and other areas uh, is one that, yes, I find myself even personally getting torn into. Then I have to make a decision on where I'm going to stand. Sure. Let me get to the point that I was going to make. So I, I, I've, I've been um, <clears throat> studying again decisions. So I was talking with the expert just the last week it was, we make 35,000 decisions a day. 35,000 decisions a day. Isn't that something? Yeah. So you're talking about why well, I haven't made any decisions today. You did make a decision. <laughs> yeah. 35,000 decisions a day. And here's the interesting thing. 1% of those decisions are what's called split second decisions, where you have to think rapidly on your feet. So just a very, very small amount. And But those are the decisions that you were uh, referring to, Bishop, that can literally change the trajectory of our lives, can change the trajectory of how our day goes. You know, you've heard people say your attitude determines your altitude. And I do believe that. You decide whether or not will something affect you on today or whatever day it is. So uh, these are just some of the things that uh, we have to keep in mind uh, I, I had to share with you just some of my personal experiences because this this thing, you know, with the medical community versus, you know, what's happening right now in society is really, really strong. And let me just tell you, I've, I've researched the scenarios. Uh, the scenarios are saying that we could be in here for 2021, 2022. Uh, and those are the likely scenarios. That is where uh, most of the evidence is pointing before this pandemic is over. I, I have to let you know that. Um, that's and again, I understand that God has the final say, uh, but that's where the evidence lies. And there's nothing wrong with trusting science and trusting God. There is, there is no uh, conflict in that. We create the conflict. Um, God is not bothered by science. Uh, he, he is a God who is of order. He created science. Uh, he just wants to make sure that we recognize him when the time comes. Yeah, yeah, understood. And that's good stuff, Elder. And hopefully uh, to our, 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 um, our partners that are with us today watching, that's where we stand in this uh, um, in this gap. Uh, 
part of this, uh, our vision is to be uh, to be the gap dwellers, to kind of join this chasm together as God gives us grace. Great point, as you were talking, uh, Dr. Shepard, it came to me on the theological end that one of the uh, uh, attributes that we ascribe to God is uh, not only omnipresence, but omniscience, which is really means all science. Uh, omniscience, all knowledge. Mm. And so this idea is where we want to stand. Uh, I, I call it, and this is my own term, like in this place of, of informed hope. Uh, uh, if it goes on a continuum from despair to uh, cynicism, to skepticism, to hope, to uh, unrealistic hope, or what psychology calls fanciful or fancy fantasia or wishful thinking and false hope. Um, and so if we're on that continuum uh, uh, and there's tension between the polarities, we hope to stand in the gap of informed hope to say this is what uh, uh, um, uh, uh, our constant observations of nature's conformity to power is telling us this. And so, uh, and at the same time, there is the hope uh, uh, that we can live in uh, so that we don't sink into despair. So faith is not the absence of awareness of, 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 of healthy faith, mm -hmm. of certain challenges and, and situations. Um, it is uh, the consent to say, okay, I'm preparing for this. And I'm also aware that there's an element uh, uh, beyond my control. In the DSM, they call it not otherwise specified. <laughs> uh, uh, <yeah. laughs> so uh, we leave room for an unknown factor, and so um, and so we're just um, trying to dwell in that place. Uh, and actually, on the um, on the theological side, there are several churches uh, uh, that are making decisions. And um, um, I'll, I'll just speak from my own is that um, uh, um, actually I'm aware of several pastors who are suggesting that we move cautiously and systemically and intentionally and strategically and not impulsively. Um, I, I know several. Again, uh, the, sometimes the, um, uh, uh, there's certain minor factors that get more pressed, but um, uh, the statistics uh, show that um, in general, 93% of churches are um, uh, leaving or closed right now um, and or in compliance. Um, that's in general, 80% of the African-American uh, Protestant churches are in compliance, uh, absolute from the beginning. And so there is a large, and even now there's a large push to say, hey, uh, we have some other things to consider. And so on these decision-making things is moving more towards personal responsibility, even as we hear some of the, um, the tension between the politics of decision-making on the national level and the science of decision-making on the national level. Um, on the pastoral side, um, uh, there's several considerations that I make uh, just in the transparent moment. Um, um, we have to decide when and where um, when and when to open, how to open. Um, legal permission and social behavior can be two different things. Um, legal, I'll say that again, legal, legal permission and social things can be two different things. Here's how Paul put it, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. And so uh, in the context of the text he's talking about, we have to have a kind of awareness that transcends even um, uh, uh, secular uh, uh, laws. And so um, distinguishing what is legal and what is moral. Some things are legal, but they're not moral. Uh, and so we just, we, we operate with that awareness. And as, uh, um, what is the, so here's just a few things. What is the guiding philosophy of pastoral care that I ask myself? As pastors, we uh, we have there several roles or metaphors for pastoring in the Bible. There's the pastor as priest, who is the worship leader. There's pastor as prophet, who is the critic of the culture. And then there's pastor as elder, who is the wise sage, 
structure of how to use the knowledge we have. And then, um, of course, there is um, uh, the pastor in uh, uh, all of those roles as uh, shepherd. And the one that I take as the first one in this season is shepherd to protect sheep. Uh, and so then that leading guide imagery then begins to determine all the other things. So as shepherd, I had to ask myself, what is another way that I can lead worship as priest? And so the shepherd, if you will, is taking precedent to say, I got to protect the sheep or under shepherd. And then the under shepherd says to the priest, okay, yes. how can you protect the people and still need the find the need to worship? And then the prophet has to say, okay, I hear what the state is saying, but the laws of men and the rules of men change all the time. Being a political leader is a little different from being <clears throat> a, a, a spiritual leader. A political leader goes by popularity polls. And when the popularity polls and the pressures and the, the PACs and the special interest groups put pressure on you, you may have to adjust uh, for the sake of your political position. Spiritual leadership says, I've heard from the Lord. <laughs> and this is how we're going to go. And even if it looks like it leads to the cross, God will raise me back up. And so as leader, spiritual leader, I have to say, what is God saying? And if God is not saying reopen, particularly given the demographic that I have to protect, that are more vulnerable, more susceptible to the most clear manifestation mm -hmm. of the situation, then the shepherd has to take the lead and find another way to be the priest and other ways to do that. So all those things are in the decision-making process. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, that's just a few things on the pastoral end. Um, but, but on the medical end, Dr. Shepard, but here's my point. Uh, there is no decision that is made without a philosophical or psychological context. The very idea, and this is what I, I'd love to get your feedback on, Dr. Shepard, the very idea of cognitive behavioral science says that observable behaviors are the result of thinking patterns. The decisions we make mm -hmm. are influenced by culture, they're influenced by upbringing, they're influenced by um, um, uh, physiological predeterminants, diathetic conditions, biopsychosocial realities, all influence our decision-making processes. And what we're trying to do is bring those things to light so that our decisions aren't always impulsive, but are sometimes intentional. And so because there is no decision that is made without psychological, sociological context. Uh, and so we're examining that. What do you think, Dr. Shepard? These are my musings for the yeah, day. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that uh, just studying decisions. So there was another colleague of mine who gave me an acronym. And anybody who knows me, I like to break things down, especially through acronyms. And it's TAHO, T-A-H-O. So your thoughts determine your actions. Your actions determine your habits and your habits determine your outcomes. So we have to remember that Tahoe, your thoughts determine your actions, your actions determine your habits, and your habits determine your outcomes. And I'll be honest with you, some of us are really struggling right now because our thoughts even prior to the pandemic were just not in the right place. And so even with that, it has determined some negative outcomes for us uh, and even though some of us, even if we, our thoughts were in the right place, they've now shifted. And uh, I've seen the paradigm shift. Uh, and I maybe have spoken about this earlier on this show, that there are people who I relied upon and, uh, you know, look to for support. Uh, but they even say they've been shaken by this. And so even their thoughts have uh, caused them to now make certain actions that they normally would not do. And my fear and I want you all to hear me clearly on this, is that we have to uh, come in and we're part of the treatment plan, truthfully, uh, for the society. This show is part of that because we don't want your negative thoughts 
to continue to compound and become bad actions, and then you develop bad habits. That's one of the reasons why I speak so strongly with parents. I speak so strongly with the people who I serve and I treat that we have to intervene so that we can cut off between the actions and habits because we understand that once something becomes habitual, it's gonna to lead to a negative outcome. So I uh, wanted to stress that important. I'll say it one more time, your thoughts determine your actions, your actions determine your habits, your habits determine your outcomes. Let me just say this now. That, that's why this particular uh, interaction that we have is so crucial because uh, you know, uh, Bishop wrote the book, Critical Collaboration. Um, doctors, we face the same type of, um, the same type of respect, uh, or not respect, res the same type of responsibility, that's the R word I'm looking for, that a preacher or a spiritual leader has. You may say, well, how is that? We may receive a report that we don't necessarily like that goes contrary to what you wanna hear. That may go contrary to what you're thinking and even what we may ever want to deliver. But it is our duty and responsibility to do our job, to deliver a report, to deliver some news that you may not wanna hear. That is in step in line with what may happen with a prophet, with a preacher, because they have to be able to deliver the word of God. And it may not feel good to you. You may not even want to hear it. You may leave that house of worship saying, I'm not going back there because of such and such. The same attitudes and the same type of, um, uh, man, the word is escaping me, but the same type of responsibility. I know that's one of the words but the same type of weight, maybe that's a, a good word, that a, uh, that a preacher or a pastor would feel, physicians feel that same weight also because we have to be able to let people know that this is what the report is saying. Uh, yes, you may look like you're well. On the outside, everything is looking well, but on the inside, there's some things that are going on that are going awry. And I can really, uh, feel for those parents when they get a diagnosis for their child who has leukemia. The child looks well. Um, it doesn't look like anything is wrong with the child. They may have noticed that the child might be more fatigued or tired and they run these tests. That is the duty of that, uh, of that physician to let that person know, I have not done my due diligence unless I have the, uh, the uh, uh, audacity and the skill set and the sensitivity to be able to deliver to you to deliver to you the news that you need to hear, and that's what we're facing right now, uh, even uh, even in this society, because Dr. Fauci and some of the other people from CDC they're delivering news, and they don't want to deliver that news. He's human, just like us. He doesn't want to tell people that we may be in this much longer. He doesn't want to tell people that we may lose a hundred and thirty thousand people by the end of August. Who wants to... say things like that, make a decision to do that. Let me say this one thing, um, and I feel I need to say this. There's some of you all who have been dealing with some reports, whether it been medical reports, whether it been financial reports, and you've been really struggling about what to do next. Let me tell you, you need to make sure that you have prayed about it and sought out some counseling, all right? Um, I don't wanna stay there too long, but I needed to say that. I, 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 can, I can only imagine what some of the people who are listening to us today who, who will go back and listen to this are really uh, struggling within their minds. Um, I have this shirt on, not just because it was the only clean shirt I had, <laughs> but the shirt says that prayer lives matter, all right? Uh, prayer lives do matter. So prayer, uh, we were talking about cognitive behavioral uh, 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 therapy or thinking. Um, there is a settling that occurs when you meditate and when you pray. And this is something that we need to make sure that we're doing during this time of decision making. Just had to digress right there real quick, Bishop.
Yeah, yeah, it 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 certainly fits, um, Dr. Shepard. It really does. Uh, because again, there, there's the categories. We're gonna stand for you again. He said, pray counseling. Here's the categories again: catharsis, which means cleaning, get it out. Um, uh, um, journal it. You can write out your prayers. Look at the book of Psalms. Write it out. You know, my enemies triumphing over me. <laughs> um, let God arise. Let my enemies be scattered. So he goes through. Get get it out, um, and get it out in a way that is with you and the Lord. Uh, again, um, because uh, um, when you put it on social media raw, uh, and I'm not against social media, but we're talking about what you just did was cleanse and counsel. Um, that, that's that's the two areas. Prayer is is a kind of catharsis, uh, and then counsel or consultation. Those two things together, when you go right to putting all your raw feelings out, then you're going right to counseling because that's when people start chiming in, and you're not always getting the best counsel. You just put it in the public square, your intimate feeling, and so uh, uh, and so. Uh, there's a big difference in the quality of your counsel. Counsel is on a continuum too. <laughs> and so, uh, and so uh, in, certain, in times like these, uh, and so you just want to be mindful of those things and be sure you want, we have to be sure we want counsel and not attention. I'm gonna just let that say lot right mm. there because they two different things. <laughs> Uh, uh, one is born from get better, and the other one is birthed from an addictive uh, uh, addiction to affirmation. And so um, we have to be sure we want counsel and not just affirmation or promotion. And so uh, uh, we'll deal with that later. I'll probably take some hits from that. But sometimes when you read people's feeds and stuff, you can see addiction to attention all the time. Uh, uh, that's that's happening there. But uh, what he just said was counsel, cleanse, catharsis, and then counsel, and then consider these things. Ponder them in your heart, as Mary did, and then make a commitment. They're, 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 they're the stages uh, that I'm submitting uh, for us. We had a very good, um, and, and oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Shepard, let me touch on what you said. So what you're saying is, um, uh, drawing a parallel between pastoral and um, medical professionals in this sense. And uh, actually, uh, uh, I've heard this analogy before that we have to tell the truth. Uh, the, the theological equivalent is preach the word in season and out of season, which is in games for some the time when people don't want to hear what you have to say. There'll be a time when people have itchy ears. Yep. Be a time when people just want to feel better. And then there'll be times when they have something else. Uh, and so uh, and so there'll be a time when you're popular and there'll be a time when you're unpopular. Mm -hmm. But you have to stay consistent on mm -hmm. your assignment and not be moved by the whims yeah. uh, of those. And so because of that, what came to mind is both professions are susceptible to misplaced grief. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Who may not hear what they wanted to hear. Uh, misplaced grief is like when David's men at Ziklag in 1 Samuel 30 lost all of their belongings and loved ones, and then they spoke of stoning David, who did not do it, but they needed right. to objectify their right. grief. And so both uh, right. sisters and medical professionals and pastoral professionals are susceptible to misplaced grief. I might even add, here's the bishop talking, the defensor of Fidei, the defender of the faith. Here's the bishop talking. Even the church is subject to misplaced grief. The church every now and then gets reminded that we are the body of Christ, the body that took on wounds for things it did not do. <laughs> and so, so even the church is susceptible to misplaced grief. Um, and so there are some parallels there. That the difference is we're not perfect. Uh, but um, uh, speaking of that, right. hearing truth, um, Angela Pinkney, and forgive me, I'm going by Facebook uh, uh, if I'm losing titles and things, but ask the question uh, and wants the truth, Dr. Uh, Shepard. Uh, will these vaccines be safe because there's talk of vaccine and Operation Warp Speed and uh, all of those things? And will these vaccines be safe? 
and how can we differentiate the decision about whether to take it? That's a very good question. Um, let me tell you how we operate in the medical world when it comes to vaccines and scientific trials. Uh, it's just that, it's a scientific trial. Vaccines take months to years to develop. Uh, why does it take that long? Because we have to make sure that is number one, safe, and then number two, effective. So there have been some medications that have been developed, uh, even as I studied through medical school, that were effective, but they were not safe because they had tremendously bad side effects. They had tremendously uh, um, outcomes. So the person could get uh, that particular illness cured, but then it brought on something else. <laughs> so. That's why we have scientific trials. And the only way to be able to do that requires time. So to be able to answer that question about vaccines being safe, it will require time and patience. That's why I get concerned when people start making um, guesstimates that something will be out and effective and safe by the end of year 2020, because that just goes against the timeline of what we have studied even in school. And, and most doctors, uh, if they're uh, good and, 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 and know their stuff, will tell you it does not, uh, uh, it, it will take, I'll just say like this, I hate using negatives. It will take several months to years to develop something that is effective. And then if you look at the flu vaccine, we have to continue to modify that vaccine each year because of the strain of the flu. So even though we have developed it for 2020, we may have to go back and develop something different for 2021. And we don't know if the coronavirus will follow that format or not. We just don't know because again, it's novel, it's new to us. This particular strain is. Uh, so I, I, I really don't. So to answer your question, uh, time and patience will determine whether or not it's safe and effective. Bishop, let me say this real quick. You said something that was very key. We may need to pick this up for future sessions. I really think we do need to, because you said something. That's why I, when you saw me writing, you, you say some things. I have to write it down so I don't forget. Um, leaders and MDs, doctors are susceptible to misplaced grief. That's why health care or self-care is so important to those particular persons, because Misplaced grief will cause you then to commit suicide, literally take your own life. And that's what we see even in the medical world. We see it in the church world. Pastors kill themselves. Doctors kill themselves. I believe there was a story uh, about a doctor in New York, just how much grief that she was handling as she took care of the various patients who were suffering with COVID-19. It weighed on her so much, so she ended up killing her own self. What does that tell you? It tells you that, well, it tells you a lot of things, that we need to be mindful of the weight and responsibility, I go back to that, that these leaders carry, and that you have to be apt to know how to be able to place that grief and those difficult decisions that you have to make into appropriate categories and then be able to also have a way of release so that you can get that relief that you need. So uh, I wanted to just further that conversation just a little bit more because we're gonna have to deal with it and tackle that because many people coming out of this are not gonna be the same. They will not be the same. Uh, and that makes sense. Uh, those who have suffered, pastors who have suffered several members of their congregation dying from COVID-19 will not be the same. If they are the same, they're not telling you the truth. <laughs> you know, that, that we have to be able to minister to them. Doctors, you know, even myself, um, thankfully I haven't had any patients yet to die from COVID-19, but I've had patients who have suffered COVID from COVID-19 uh, and it was affected their families. And I understand 
that how I will approach them moving forward has to be different. So um, let me stop there. That's good. That's good, Doctor. And I, I'll, I'll concur. Listen, you all have just uh, uh, witnessed us doing our next uh, uh, discussion topic next week on um, uh, misplaced grief and self care. Uh, I think that's. I think that is uh, when you getting to hear you mirror that back. It's like, oh yeah, that's that's good because we need to talk about uh, that, um, and we'll we'll add in some of the pieces. Uh, uh, about uh, one of our uh, writers is does misplaced grief correlate with vicarious stress, secondary traumatic stress, and we'll deal with that uh, in next week's. Um, uh, because that's a topic in and of itself. Uh, and so we're grateful. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, uh, uh, my friend Bishop Lloyd Austin, uh, from North Carolina. Thank you for being with us today, sir. Uh, so grateful for you being a part of this uh, time of sharing. Uh, listen, we'll put it this way. There are many components because we're wrapping up, but um, um, there are many components uh, to the decision-making process. Uh, it becomes a matter of being conscious uh, of, of the components that are there and making priorities. Um, as um, Dr. Shepard was talking about the vaccine and, and, and when it looks like it's going to, what is a, a scientifically plausible um, um, timeline, it still has some degree of uncertainty because it's still in testing phase. And so, um, and so with that, what came to mind to close is, um, is to um, just be mindful a little bit of, and this might be a controversial, but be mindful of puffery. P-U-F-F-E-R-Y, puffery. Puffery, and again, because decisions are influenced, again, by sociological context as well. Just be aware that we live in a marketing culture and that has a place. But in such, again, we're talking about what is expedient and what is helpful. In, 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 in marketing, there is room given under the puffery principle. Puffery is to exaggerate or use superfluous language to sell a product. Well, the term is puffery. So you can sell uh, uh, in a commercial, I don't know, this is a random example, but let's say I make lawnmowers. I do not, but let's say I make a lawnmower. I would have a little license to make commercials for the sake of selling lawnmowers to say that C. Guy Robinson makes the best lawnmowers in the world. And I can say that, world's best lawnmowers. I can make a sign that says it. And the puffery principle gives me some room to be superfluous to sell my product, and, and it, it, it is, and, and that's the society. And so, and but that's a little different. That if you're listening as an academician or as a scientist or even as a well-informed consumer, you ask different questions. What is the research methodology for your claim? <laughs> How many other lawnmower companies did you consult? What is uh, the size of your sample pool and the diversity of the persons who agree that you make the best lawnmower. That, that's the question of research methodology. And so we have to be careful when we're seeing a battle between puffery and research methodology, uh, if you will. And so, um, um, because not everything that is sellable <laughs> is factual. And so, so we have to be mindful of all these things. And this is, this is not an easy place to be. So we have to ask ourselves, are we listening to salesmen or are we listening to scientists? Uh, and so, uh, and that's not to vilify either one, but it's to put them in context. And so with that in mind, um, um, I know we got to close out, but we'll deal with all of this misplaced grief. And um, what our assignment is, is to uh, prayerfully, our prayer is, is to be a help, to give you information, to make spiritual, spirit-led, healthy-minded decisions uh, in this season of turbulent times. That's our that's our prayer. We're bridging the gap, we hope, and living in the place of informed optimism. And so um, uh, hopefully uh, we are doing uh, what the Lord has called us to do. Dr. Shepherd is also a preacher of the Lord's Church. What we're, we're using our terminology intentionally 
uh, 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 so he's more gifted than uh, uh, his uh, nameplate shows. You know, we've done some doctoral studies in pastoral psychology, uh, uh, but the point is right now with Bishop Guy Robinson, because I'm speaking, if the Lord gives me great, as a defender of the faith, a leader of the church. And so we live in this world of critical collaboration. If you don't have your copy of video, and I don't know what you're waiting on, but since Dr. Shepard mentioned it, that's what we're all about. Uh, and that's what we're committed to. He's helping me to be more assertive. He's my counselor in uh, assertion. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> we bless each other. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Shepard, thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate your ministry uh, and your ministry of science because we are helped by the mind that God has given you. Uh, and so uh, uh, would you please let someone know we're on? Uh, we're on YouTube. Uh, you can follow our YouTube channel at CGR Ministries. Dr. Shepard has uh, drshepard.com. Or go, uh, what's your um, website address, doctor? Yeah, uh, there's a couple places that you can go. You can follow me actually on Facebook. Um, I have a professional page, Dr. Jonathan Shepard. Uh, materials there. You can follow me even on my personal page. Uh, you can go to my website, uh, Dr. Jonathan Shepard. That's Shepherd S H E P H E R D, like our real shepherd, uh, dot com. And so you can go to those places. Uh, you can even hit me up uh, at my uh, institution of practice at Hope Health Systems. Uh, that's all one word, hopehealthsystems.com. And if you're in need of any direct care, uh, you can call us at 410 265 8737. 410-265-8737. Uh, let me say this, Bishop, before we close. It's a beautiful day here in Maryland. Uh, this is a time for you to uh, practice physical distancing, but go outside and enjoy this time uh, so that you can make a good decision, uh, clear your mind. Uh, but I wanted to comment, it's a beautiful day, and uh, make sure you enjoy that. Enjoy this day. Yes, yes. Thank you for watching and being a part of Spirit in Mind. Please, again, reach out to us. Your questions and insight is valuable. Uh, um, CGR Ministries on Facebook. Uh, please inbox me or um, email me uh, uh, and let me know any questions or topics. We want to be helpful to you. Um, we, 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 we came to this forum uh, so that we could have more time. Uh, uh, in the other forum, we only had about 30 minutes, but coming to this forum has given us 50 minutes. That's a full counseling session, <laughs> although this is not counseling. There's a disclaimer. <laughs> 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 full session. <laughs> so, but we get a full time of sharing with you together in this 50 minute uh, format because this is ministry for us. And we pray that the ministry has been um, helpful to you. And again, thank you for watching Spirit in Mind.